The stakes have never been higher. What is your view on the future of America for our children? I mean, Marvin, it's a great question. I think a lot of parents especially ask that question. And, you know, I've written a, a number of books about past presidents and study, studied history for a long time. And I think even though we go through bad times and we're very divided as a country, I have this hope that we as a country are kind of resilient, that no matter what we go through, we can bounce back. But we are in a place where there's a choice. There are two different paths to take here. And that's why elections are so crucial. Um, the last few have come down to the wire. I mean, it's a really divided country, almost perfectly split. Um, and, you know, I think the country is resilient, but we have big, big challenges that, you know, we as a country have to deal with together. I do this thing on my show called Common Ground, where I bring Republicans and Democrats together who are working on stuff instead of arguing. Um, we could use more of that because there's some big, big issues. Two nights ago, we had the first what, what may be the only debate uh, between the two candidates. We hope not. I understand that. Um, in your view, who won? So, if you look at the points, you know, the, just the debate points, it seemed like Kamala Harris was very well prepared, very well practiced. Um, and then you put it up against the June 27th debate with President Biden. It was night and day, obviously, because he had mm -hmm. such, such troubles. So I think most people looking at it objectively said she had a good night and that he left some low-hanging fruit that he could have really taken advantage of and maybe was baited into answering questions that he didn't really have to. Now, that's the analysis from left and right pundits mm -hmm. looking at it objectively. However, you know, since the debate, listening to people talk about it, and middle America especially, you know, they didn't see it the same way. There was, uh, it was more about wanting to know more about policies, and they didn't feel like they had an answer to what Kamala Harris is for. Um, they know Donald Trump, and, you know, despite, you know, whatever you think about his antics and how he does things, they kind of know what he's about and who he's about. Um, so how it moves the needle or if it moves the needle, I think, is the bigger question ahead of the election. So you know, it's not for me to say who won. I think on points, she did really well. But in the big picture, you know, he may not have it may not have changed this election dynamic that much. It didn't seem to really come out. By either the moderators or the candidates, but. In your view, what were the singular, plural, issues that are going to determine the next president? The economy drives pretty much every election. How people think about their personal situation as they're sitting at the kitchen table with their family, doing the budget on the back of an envelope, um, you know, figuring out how to make ends meet. Inflation and how much things cost really hits home. And I think that that drives a lot of it, which is why Trump is doing so well as he hits on that issue again and again and again. You know, Democrats are trying to paint a picture of turning the page, moving forward. But it's tougher when you have an incumbent vice president who's been there for three and a half years. Um, so they push you know, issues like threat to democracy and January 6th, and most importantly, abortion, because they think that that really moves, especially suburban women, um, and it does. So on the Democratic side, I think, you know, abortion and uh, I'm not Donald Trump drives that. And on the, the Republican side, 
inflation, the economy, and immigration are the top pillars. Uh, how this country deals with that and whether they think that Kamala Harris can change their current status where they are uh, is going to be what determines the election. What are the fundamental reasons not to vote for Donald Trump? So somebody who is not voting for Donald Trump would say they're doing it, and we've heard this, because they think he's erratic. They are not sure what um, his foreign policy would look like, whether it's too uh, protectionist, nationalistic, um, that January 6th and how he handled that day uh, sits in their mind, and they have a lot of questions about the way forward, should he not have guardrails the second time, and who he's going to put behind around him uh, in office. Um, they say that those things about character are the motivating factors uh, to try to get back to something normal when you listen to the people who are against Donald Trump. And what are the fundamental reasons not to vote for Kamala Harris? The Trump supporters would say that she is an amoeba on policy. She's all over the place. In 2019, when she ran for president, she had a list of very progressive uh, policies um, providing, you know, transition surgeries for illegal immigrants, uh, opening the border, um, uh, no fracking, Green New Deal, uh, energy kind of uh, squelching policies uh, in order to benefit the climate um, and fight climate change. And what they feel are stifling regulations and more of the same as far as the economy. They think she is a wolf in sheep's clothing when it comes to a progressive ideologue. And, you know, they point to interviews just recently from Senator Bernie Sanders, who said, yes, she's doing what she needs to do to get elected, but she's still a progressive. Um, so they point to that on policy being a real question mark. And, you know, that she's been in office for three and a half years. Why didn't she do the things she's talking about now at the beginning? Conversely, what are the reasons to vote for Donald Trump? Supporters will say that he is who he is. He is strong. He is decisive. Uh, and they point back to his time in office and how they felt about their own personal situation, their economy, foreign policy. Um, he didn't get America engaged in more wars, and they feel like he's somebody that can kick the table over and shake up Washington. That's what the biggest thing. You know, I, I went to 36 different um, Ubers in swing states in 2016, and I was taking these Uber rides, and at the end of the ride, I would say, listen, if you don't mind, you know, can I ask you about the election? How are you going to vote? 34 out of 36 said they were voting for Donald Trump instead of Hillary Clinton. And I'm talking every race, every ethnicity, every background. And I said, why, why is that? And most of them said the exact same thing or something similar. Both sides suck. And we need to kick the table over and try something different. And that is the mentality of, like, shake up a system that is entrenched and needs to be broken up. They think Donald Trump is the change agent. And what is the reason to vote for Kamala Harris? If you think that... Um, there is a threat from Donald Trump that he is 
unstable as far as his decision making, as you point back to January 6th and other things, if you believe that um, he is a threat to democracy, as her supporters do. Uh, as she's talking about the economy, she's pledging uh, to do more things to bring people together, to bring both sides together. She's talking about immigration and passing a bipartisan immigration bill. She's talking uh, like a center-left politician would talk. Um, and to not threaten um, the normality of, of our country as far as uh, a leader who is not going to shake things up as far as um, uh, turning the Washington upside down. And if you believe in the foreign policy of supporting Ukraine against Russia, if you believe uh, in generally what uh, the Biden administration has been focused on on foreign mm -hmm. policy and in domestic policy. You know, they tout a lot of things, the infrastructure bill, um, the bipartisan effort on climate change, uh, which they called the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, they talk about what they see as major economic things heading in the right direction. They want to finish the job that Biden started. So if you're supporting Kamala Harris, you believe that finishing that job is important. You know, um, later on after this is published, I think I'm going to reread those four answers because you said so much, it's almost impossible to digest the pros and the cons for each candidate. Well, and it's not. With all the noise that's going on in the world today, that the things are true or false and true and false. Which brings me <clears throat> to polls. Um, I try and channel surf, and she's winning, he's winning, he's winning, she's winning, the swing states, she's ahead, he's ahead. We know what happened with Hillary. <coughs> Are polls meaningful or meaningless, A, and B, how can we get polls to be more forthright and accurate in the future, or, or it's never going to happen? This is a great question because I think a lot of people are frustrated by polls. We have so many of them, and they have different uh, methodologies, different ways that they do it. Um, and people rely on it. And they do rely on it. Ugh. A poll really is a snapshot in time at a place. Um, we, in 2016, realized how screwed up the system was. It missed. It missed things. I mean, mm. we were in the exit poll meeting that night on election night, thought that the election was going to be called for Hillary Clinton by 11 p.m. It was off by... Five, six points. And and that's an exit poll for that day. I mean, yeah. so we started systems that mm -hmm. started to do it differently. We realized that Trump voters answer things differently. Sometimes they don't want to answer the pollster. Sometimes um, they're not picking up the phone. Um, sometimes, you, you know, you deal with landlines and not cell phones. And we have an issue of trying to figure out to get to the Trump voter. Now, eight years later, it's better. They're doing better at getting those voters. But it's still, most pollsters would tell you, undercounts the Trump vote by two to three points. So if you look at a poll that's tied in a state, and it is Trump versus Kamala Harris, you can assume that there is an undercounted Trump vote by two or three points. But let me ask this, because I don't know the tech of it. Do they design who they're going to ask to try and get, I mean, if you're the New York Times and you're a liberal newspaper, you probably want it to come out better for the, the Democratic candidate. Can they finesse the audience that they're polling in order to achieve the result that they prefer? Well, the answer to that, short answer is yes, they can. Um, the long answer is most pollsters want to be the most accurate at the end, 
uh, closest to the end result so that they can say they were closest. Uh, but during the election, those polls do influence people as they look at things. To, to, is something happening here? I mean, there was a poll before the last election that had uh, Trump trailing by 17 points in Wisconsin. It ended up being less than 1 percent, the difference in Wisconsin. Well, what was the explanation for that? It was not. There, no one went back and challenged them. The, the point being that there are different people that are called. They do cater and try to figure out what the best cross-section is, but it's mm-hmm. imperfect. And to be real, we need to get ourselves off of relying and focusing so much on polls and get out and about and talk to people. When we go out mm-hmm. to these different states and actually sit in a diner mm-hmm. and talk to people, that's the difference. Yeah, but the the mystery or the truthfulness is that there are six or seven states that determine the winner. It's worse than that. It's seven, let's say seven states, yeah. and in those states, about one-sixth of the population. Yeah. So you're talking about maybe a yeah. grand total of 300,000 yeah. people in seven states yeah. in a country of 330 million. Think about that. And so that's where the focus comes, those swing states. Which brings us to an obvious question, electoral votes versus popular votes. Um, I've heard arguments on both sides. Uh, It should be the popular vote, the Democratic point of view for the most part, and the electoral vote more or less on the Republican side because the popular vote pretty much is always Democrat. Given the makeup of our country, how strongly do you feel that it should be one or the other and why? I think the founders thought about this a lot in the Constitutional Convention in 1787. And believe it or not, they battled over whether this was the right way to go or not. What ended up happening is that they realized that the smaller states needed a voice, that middle America, in those days it was middle, but it became middle America, needed an equal voice, not more of a voice, but an equal voice. If you did it only by the popular vote, you're right. The big population centers, which trend, trend to the left, uh, would be dominating almost every election. Um, so the system we have does work. It just gets tested when it is this close, a divided country. If you can't move the needle, I mean, Kamala Harris needs to win by four or five points in the popular vote to win the Electoral College. That's the bottom line. Um, Donald Trump could lose the popular vote and has and still win the Electoral College. Or the Electoral College, as crazy as this sounds, could come out to a tie at which point it's sent to the House of Representatives and each state delegation votes on the presidency. Currently, Donald Trump would win that, but it's the new Congress that votes on it. So just imagine the constitutional crisis if we got to that point, 269 to 269. All right, so why are you there? While I'm here. All right. (laughs) Roll back the tape a few weeks ago. We almost lost one of the candidates. Yeah. Which is hard to believe if you think about where we are now. Right. It's hard to believe, but what I'm asking you, and I don't know the answer to it, and I'm dying to hear what you have to say. Suppose the sniper was successful. What would be happening at the election right now? Where would we be? I honestly don't know. Marvin, I think the country would be in chaos. There, there would be a major, major uprising of, of there, there would be major problems. Apparently, we were an eighth of an inch away from that happening. Yeah. And you think about what would have happened had he been assassinated. Uh, it's hard to imagine. I think people would have taken to the streets. Trump supporters would have. Um, there wasn't a formal process. Uh, J.D. Vance hadn't been announced. Um, you know, that didn't happen until officially till the convention. 
Um, I'm guessing it would have been like this mini primary to figure out who's going to run. It would have been. They'd have to postpone the election. A total, total mess. We still don't know the motive of the shooter, nor do we know why the Secret Service would not have covered a rooftop in plain sight, easy distance. Uh, the whole thing is, is totally crazy. It's egregious. It is egregious that it's been this long and we don't have more answers to how that happened. Now, some people lost their jobs, Secret Service. But most importantly, we have to make sure it doesn't happen again. It was... But, you know, make sure it doesn't happen again begs the point. How something as simple and primary as protecting the rooftops where this direct view in a short distance could not be protected and a a man can walk in, climb a roof, have a, a rifle take aim and shoot. So because of the lack of information, because of the lack of answers, it is easy to jump to conspiracy theories. It's really easy. It's a short hop. And I'm telling you that some very well-known people have already gotten there. Uh, So there's a real push, a bipartisan push. Supposedly the FBI or the CIA uncovered plans for Iran to do something, not necessarily that day and that place, but there was, why can't they determine what motivated this kid? They have to. There's no reason why it's taken this long. And um, Mm -hmm. hopefully these investigations up on Capitol Hill are going to lend, lead to something. Recently, uh, Harris uh, selected her vice presidential candidate and people then, and even more so now, think she made the wrong choice, and she should, and people were thinking that she would have um, selected, um, what's his name? Josh Shapiro. Josh Shapiro of Pennsylvania. Who, should, in your mind, who should she have selected and why? One of those two or somebody else? Clearly, she's comfortable with Governor Walz of Minnesota. Um, I think he has presented some problems, you know, as far as trying to uh, portray that they're somehow coming towards the center. He has a lot of uh, progressive left uh, policies that he signed on to as governor of Minnesota. Um, I'm not sure, you know, exactly what, mm-hmm. what the thinking was other than he is this middle America guy, is a gun owner, who is, um, you know, from a Midwestern state, and she felt comfortable with him. But just electorally, the advantage that she would have potentially had to choose Josh Shapiro mm-hmm. of Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is such a key state yeah. that if they won Pennsylvania, yeah. the rest of the dominoes. Yeah, I mean, fell. I-, I thought that was the, by a wide margin, the person that she would pick. Same thing with Trump. I I don't I never, with heard, I never heard J.D. Vance. I know that there were some really big issues with Nikki Haley, but a lot of people thought that if he really wanted to win, he should have picked Nikki Haley. I hear that all the time from... Uh, um, from Trump supporters. You have to look through the prism of where he was looking. He, at that time, was running against President Biden. He was doing exceptionally well in the polls. Uh, clearly, you know, felt like he had an advantage. And I think at that point, doubled down mm-hmm. on MAGA and his legacy instead of thinking maybe more about what something like Nikki Haley, somebody like Nikki Haley would do. He also has a personal it, it was more who he engaged with and and, and felt comfortable with. Um, but both of these vice president nominees have caused their tickets some problems. These are all what if kind of questions, but um, right now the Republican Party is Trump's party. He loses. 
who, what does the leadership look like of the Republican Party going forward? That's a fantastic question. And honestly, I think it is wide open. I think there could be a cast of thousands in the next election. Who would be in the top? I mean, I can't even yeah. imagine. I mean, there's... Because he's so dominant. That's true. And there will be some people that come forward that uh, want to take on the MAGA uh, mantle and continue that. They think they've uh, changed the party into more of a worker um, party. Um, and then there will be, I think, more traditional establishment Republicans who sing, think that this is the time for the empire to strike back and um, to to have more of a back to what they consider a normal Republican party. But consider the dilemma. Neither one of us even have a list. No, I mean I can I can get you to governors. I can get you to to prominent. Senators. But nobody stands out. Not right now. Because they, yeah. they can't stick their head out like that yeah. right now. Um, but listen, again, that's hypothetical. I do think that if he wins, it changes the dynamic uh, as far as this the party being more like him longer. Yeah. Uh, but I think there would be a real battle for the heart of the Republican Party if he does lose. Okay. Same question. Come with losers. Where is the future? Who are the future leaders of the Democratic Party? Clearly, Gavin Newsom has ambitions higher than uh, governor of California. Yeah, but then look at the experience of California. True. It's not exactly the best thing to sell. Yeah. Um, you know, I always said that Ron DeSantis had a bumper sticker that was like, I want to make America Florida. Yeah. If you have that bumper sticker in California and I want to make America California, there's a lot of states that yeah. are not on to that, that program. But, other, other than Gavin? Um, you know, I think a Josh Shapiro in Pennsylvania has ambitions. I think, um, you know, there, there are others who were considered uh, VP that, that would probably step up. Um, but, again, there would be a battle for the heart of the Democratic Party. It's just like the MAGA and the more establishment Republicans. There is the progressive side under the Bernie Sanders and the, the squad and yeah. then there is a more centrist side of the Democratic yeah. Party that so yeah. far has been losing a lot on the policy. Now that you, you mentioned DeSantis, he was like the number two, and then Nikki made a run. Maybe it's one of those. Definitely. I mean, they, they, they I both mean, still yeah. have ambitions. Yeah. They still think that they have a, a path. Yeah. Yeah. Clearly, Nikki Haley would try to step up. In this time with social media and online, people getting information from all different places, it is tough for people to understand what's true and what's not. And that's one of the reasons I look at my job as something that, one, I love to do, I'm passionate about, but also I take a real responsibility. Because I feel like there are a lot of people that need to tune into something that they can trust. And so I kind of look at my job in the news side of things as being an ice hockey goalie trying to stop the bad pucks from getting past. And there's a lot of bad pucks on social media, online, in today's world. Add another dim dimension in AI and all the cheap fakes Ooh. and all kinds of stuff. So we take a lot of effort to try to Ooh. find where the truth is but to be able to just report and let people yeah. decide how they feel about you it. You know, I'm so happy you brought that up. But you addressed it for social media, AI, and things like that. How about the fundamental media? How about if you're a Democrat, you read the New York Times, the Washington Post, you watch ABC, NBC, and so forth. And if you're a Republican, you got Fox, you have the New York Post, you have, I mean, the Wall Street Journal to me is as fair as they come. Um, but the news media is in silos. And rather than, you know, a young person who goes to journalism school in the old days learned the Walter Cronkite 
view of journalism, which is objectivity, source your information, double up on the sourcing the information, and give both sides and let the reader decide, the viewer decide. Our media today, ABC is a perfect example the other night where they're fact-checking repeatedly Trump and don't fact-check uh, Harris. But you don't even need that as an example. There are so many... Um, when the Post um, disclosed about the laptop, it wasn't covered by the traditional media it wasn't allowed to be covered in social media, which we now know happened. Why did it happen? And will, can it ever come back to the point where an American can trust the media? Because they can't trust the media. And for that matter, all the polls say they don't trust the politicians. It's a horrible dilemma that our world, our country is in today. I agree. And um, I'm trying to be an oasis of sanity um, in a crazy world. So I commend special reports, 6 p.m. Eastern time, Monday through Friday. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, listen, I, in all seriousness, I do think it is a smaller universe of news shows and news um, that is trying to achieve what I'm trying to achieve. And uh, fortunately, the... Leaders at Fox have, I've been there 27 years. I took over for Brit Hume 16 years ago. Mm -hmm. And they have empowered me as executive editor of the show um, to do what I'm doing, which is uh, to give all sides a shot to lay it out there and let viewers decide. And I tell people, you know, watch my show three times, left, right, and center. And drop me an email or a tweet or a message and tell me if you thought it was fair. And people who go through that exercise come back and usually tell me it is. We have a lot of Democrats and independents uh, who watch the show, We're evenly split from, uh, according to Pew Research and others. I think it's a really important conversation to have because there are more and more outlets that mm. want to cater to people who want to hear what they want to hear. And... You know, there's plenty of places to look for that. There's not a lot of places that cover the news, and I'm trying to be that. Why wouldn't the people at the top of all these powerful multinational corporations give a dictum down to their their key executives in each of these media? They say, look, we need to be fair to all Americans. We need to be unbiased. If you can't be unbiased, then you can't work for us. Yeah, I wish... I'm talking about news shows, not opinion shows. Right. I, oh. I mean, I think the answer to that question probably comes in, in the bottom line. They see clicks, they see money, they see um, advertising, they see audiences that expand when they play to a certain base. Um, you know, and I assume that that's some of the decision-making. All I know is that leaders at Fox... There's clearly an opinion side that does a great job, and they come from a conservative point of view, um, different flavors of the opinion. Um, but just like a newspaper with a news page and an mm -hmm. opinion page, we have a different section mm -hmm. uh, that deals with news. I think I wish more and more people would do it. I wish there were more news programs, mm -hmm. and um, I just don't see them. Or an attempt to be independent. Um, moving around, um, China, Russia, Iran, who should we be fearing? Who should we be protecting ourselves from going forward? You know, I've asked that question to a lot of national security experts on, you know, both sides of the aisle. And, um, most come back with China being the biggest competitor. Um, but, you know, Iran with nuclear weapons uh, is, you know, a game changer. 
uh, and supposedly they're only a couple of weeks away if they flick the switch uh, to being able to, to have enough enriched uranium to get a nuclear weapon. That's the latest IAEA uh, report. Russia obviously is an aggressor and is um, also has nuclear weapons. Um, so that's the big threat, big picture. Mm-hmm. But as far as a, a global competitor, you know, China is probably our our biggest um, biggest issue. You think about today, Putin has actually murdered. I don't know the number, but a significant number of Ukrainian people, bombed hospitals, schools, apartment buildings, and so forth. Uh, Many of his own soldiers have died. In this day and age, um, you know, it's supposed to be a civilized country. How 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 do you justify it and get away with it? Well, you know, you can't. And you're seeing this this fight in Ukraine uh, over that very fact. I think, you know, that's a huge foreign policy issue that there are two different sides to this election. One would do something completely different than the other. Right. And um, how people look at that and the role of the U.S. is is a big determination. Well, let's stay with that for a minute because um, I'm a believer that if, Putin gets away with this, other countries, and then you have to worry about NATO and so forth. You know, um, I know Trump has a different point of view. What do you think our role should be with supporting the Ukraine um, first, and then we'll go in and yeah. have others? Yeah. So, you know, I've traveled there. Uh, I went over and did an interview with Zelensky on the front lines um, about a mile and a half from Russian forces. Congratulations. I watched that. It was yeah. amazing to see. And, um, you know, artillery was coming in during the interview. It was really quite something. Um, they are clearly trying to hold on to their country uh, and asking us uh, for help. I think mm-hmm. what former President Trump says is um, he thinks that uh, he can get a negotiated settlement. What that looks like, I don't know. Uh, he doesn't really go down that road too far as far as specifics. He said in the debate the other night that he could figure it out as president-elect right. uh, in, in a number of days. You know, what does it look like? Let's put it probably, what he wants. It probably includes land. It probably includes yeah. eastern Ukraine. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and does Putin stop there? You know, that's... And a lot of people feel we've given a lot, so much money to Ukraine, a lot of it, is not accounted for, and that's we don't true. know what's happened to it. That's true too, and um, corruption is a problem yeah. in Ukraine. Um, so there's a lot of feelings about it. Although, yeah. if you're in Eastern Europe and you're a NATO country, you're worried absolutely um, because they feel like Putin could keep rolling. We have Russia overtly attacking and destroying human life, and we have Iran attacking directly or indirectly, however you qualify it, human life as pertains to supporting Hamas and Hezbollah and so forth as relates to Israel. Should we be negotiating with Iran? It doesn't seem to be working or it has not worked. What should America be doing in the Middle East? It's such a complicated place that... um you know, I think that you can point to the success of uh, the Trump administration and the Abraham Accords dealing with the Gulf nations and getting uh, them to agree to um, a, a deal with Israel. You look at uh, UAE, Bahrain, Kuwait, and they signed that agreement. Yeah. Um, I went over and did an interview with Mohammed bin Salman, the yeah. crown prince of Saudi Arabia, and um, I... You know, I asked him every question under the sun. I didn't hold, you know, there was nothing that was left off the table. I asked him about 9-11. I asked him about the Khashoggi murder. I watched the interviews. And um, one thing I asked was, you know, there's talks about Israel and Saudi Arabia possibly doing a deal, but maybe it's falling apart. And he said, no, it's very much on the table, and we could get a deal. So the camera cut off, and we were walking, doing a shot, and he said, Brett, you need to know that this is 
on the finish line. We could really get this deal done, and it's going to change the face of the Middle East and how every country deals with each other. But, Saudi Arabia and Israel. But it didn't get done. So then, interview ends. I get to the airport in Saudi Arabia. I get a call on my satellite phone from Bibi Netanyahu, who says, I need you to come interview me now. After that interview I just watched, I'm in New York. So I fly here to New York. I change my flight. I land at 8.30. I sit down with Prime Minister Netanyahu at 11.30. And I say, you just watched this interview with the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia. What's your response? And he said, in the words of a very smart man in the Middle East, we're getting closer every day, and it's going to change the face of the Middle East. I asked him a whole kind of bunch of questions. That camera cuts off. He says, Brett, you need to know this is going to happen. I'm going to grab the brass ring, and it's, going to, it's really close. That was eight days before October 7th when Hamas launched the attack into Israel, and it changed everything. Now, Iran obviously saw that they were vetting, getting very close and obviously flicked a switch and said, it's time. They're funding Hamas, they're funding Hezbollah, they're funding the Houthis. Um, and, you know, I think it did change everything, that attack. I'm not, I don't think it's uh, out of the realm of possibility that after this operation, which should get done sooner rather than later, according to both sides. Um, well, well, this operation referring to what? Israel taking out Hamas and Gaza uh, as much as they can. That Saudi Arabia and Israel still have hopes to make that well, deal. To your knowledge at this moment, is there some kind of a settlement that's imminent between Hamas and Israel, they've been talking about it for many months. Um, the problem is Hamas. I, I, I mean, Israel, um, right. these negotiations have continued for a long time, but Hamas has never stopped thinking or saying publicly that they're going to attack again. And so oh. negotiating a ceasefire with that mentality is a little tough, um, and it hasn't been fruitful. Um, that said, there is a lot of pressure for the fighting in Gaza to end. And then supposedly there's a hundred hostages that have yet to be returned, and people say that many of those people are dead anyway. You know, so they don't really know. Uh, why would they um, uh, kill six people, six hostages, while there's final discussions of a settlement to return the hostages back to Israel? Why does a terrorist organization do whatever it does? I but, I mean, they're, they're, in theory, good faith negotiations going on. Yeah. From the it, point it, of the view of the Israelis, it, that's yeah. their thinking. It's like, yeah. you know, what are we doing here? Why is the onus not on Hamas? Right. They're the ones holding the hostages, yeah. killing the hostages, the six that we just yeah. saw killed the other day. Um, it's frustrating, Marvin, and it is a major, major problem. So... I don't know if this is true or not, I'm asking you. Congress approved funding for Israel, also for Ukraine, much larger sums, for certain weapons and certain amount of money. And I hear that Biden was slow walking or is slow walking certain weapons that Israel needs in order to put pressure on them to settle with Hamas, Congress voted for and said, we, our country wants to support them. It was true at, at one point. I think it has changed now. The supply chain is a little bit faster. But at the beginning, they were not giving precision guided, or um, yeah, they were not giving the the bombs that they, they wanted yeah. um, because of the pressure to try to get them to stop, mm -hmm. which was counterintuitive after Congress passed this law. Um, and, and Biden signed it into law. So their their push is to get this negotiation to yeah. come to fruition. No, I get that. But it's uh, but they did slow walk weapons yeah. for some time. And by the same token, with Ukraine, they were asking for S-16s so they could 
Ukraine is in a war where it's a defensive war for them. They're not allowed, or were, in the early part of the first two years, we're not allowed to, to have an offense against Russia. But meanwhile, Russia has an offensive war where they're destroying the Ukraine people and country. And, and if you see, you've been there. I mean, cities, uh, small and large, large portions demolished. Uh, and they can def try and defend themselves, but they had no retaliation, whereas now they're starting to at least get some of the military outposts in the Russian territory. Yeah, I mean, the criticism of the Biden administration is that it took a long time to get all these weapons moving. There were restrictions on them. Um, Some say the war would have been over but long ago, and they would have had a settlement for whatever the settlement that they might or might not have this year or next year or never. Ukrainians will tell you that privately. They thought no. that it could have gone faster. Um, they're obviously very appreciative of everything they get. Yeah. Um, but there's a lot of criticism on Capitol Hill that it took a long time. Then there's this evolution. They go, no F-16s, now they got F-16s. Now they've got weapons that they're actually attacking into Russia. And that's really the question now. All right. So um, Trump and others say if he were still president, Putin would never, ever have attacked Ukraine. And in fact, during the four years he was president, they didn't. Do you believe that? I believe that's possible. I, I believe that it is possible. Uh, it's tough to prove. By the same token, there are many that say that Iran via Hamas would not have attacked Israel if Trump... I think that's more speculative, but I'd be interested in your thoughts on that, too. Well, Trump supporters would tell you that they felt like they had the boot on the neck of Iran economically with sanctions, and that Iran was really hurting as far as... You were broke. Could, they were broke. After so why did Biden release the spigot to make him rich literally overnight? Thought that there would be a positive side in negotiations with Iran on the nuclear front or mm -hmm. to try to do what Obama was trying to do, uh, make Iran the center of the Middle East policy. And, you know, with that money came a lot of um, pushing to those... Terrorist but so it, it's still the Biden administration that's in power. Upon reflection, do they acknowledge that they made a mistake in allowing Iran to become economically strong so that they can afford to s support the activities they're supporting in terms of destroying or trying to destroy Israel? They don't talk about that. They acknowledge it. Um, but privately, there's a lot of people who would say, yeah, this clearly was being funneled uh, to these terrorist proxies, and that's a big problem. So, you know, foreign policy doesn't factor into elections that mm -hmm. much, but this year, it could factor in. Do you think... The various lawsuits against Trump are because of weaponization of our government under Biden. I think it's tough to get to where Trump talks about it, which was Biden ordered it. You know, I, I think there is this um, broad sense that. Um, some of these lawsuits and some of these efforts were unfair to him on a number of different fronts, that they wouldn't have been brought if his name wasn't Donald Trump. And it's easy to get to there. It's tougher to connect you know, Biden directing prosecutors to do X, Y, and Z. Um, but I think broadly, if you ask people in polls, again, back to polls, mm -hmm. um, there is a sense that it was there's an unfair element to it. So what motivated Biden to reverse on day one the regulations that were st inhibiting the flow of illegal immigrants on the southern border 
because he's never ever articulated why he's doing it. And now that the numbers are vast and many millions, he's done very little to ebb the flow. In and, the first, first, and look what's happening to our cities all over America. Many of them are going bankrupt. Many of the crime the, uh, is far worse than it ever was. And these cities are begging for financial help from the federal government. So in the first days of the Biden administration, there were more than 90 executive orders that were overturned. And a lot of them had to do with dealing with the border and um, uh, he's never been in Mexico. Why? All of these different policies. Yeah. Um, his Homeland Security Secretary said it was about turning the page and trying to fix the immigration system. But in reality, it was working as far as keeping that border and folks on the Mexican side of the yeah. border. Um, now, you know, three and a half years later, a lot, some of those executive orders are back in place um, because they finally did it. Um, and that was the biggest question in the debate. Why didn't you do that on day one? Leave what I had in place um, when it came to those executive orders. Democrats point to this negotiated bill in the Senate that was conservatives and, and Democrats uh, and that Donald Trump politically asked them not to go forward with it because uh, he wanted the issue for the election. You know, that is factual. He definitely made those calls. But but it's, there was criticism of that bill. Exactly. And, you know, it would have allowed a lot of illegal immigrants. Two in. million plus. It was 5,000 a day, and then above 5,000, it became arbitrary. That's but, a million well, eight right there. Well, what so, I'm saying is the, the political issue, Democrats are hanging their hat on that negotiated bipartisan deal. And I think that immigration has a personal effect to a lot of people around the country. It's not just border states, as mm. you know. It's mm. a lot of cities here in New York. Mm. It's a major issue. I mean, we're all immigrants. Um, and I think a large part of the problem is it was a free fall. Nobody was being documented. Uh, there are a lot of, depending on who you speak to, there are a lot of people in the country that we would never have allowed in the country for various reasons of their background or what have you. Supposedly there's even known terrorists in our country. Why couldn't they have set up a system where you go through and we recognize and Who qualify and so forth, and those people are let in? I mean, there are many, many people that have applied legally, and unfortunately it takes a long time, but they're here now legally, and they're productive people, and many of them are becoming American citizens over time, but... It seems like we have chaos in our country now. That's true. And it's why it's a major, major issue in this election. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I talked to business leaders. Well, it's a major issue, but it wasn't really discussed much in the debate. Well, there's a choice. That's a choice that was made. By the moderators or by the... Well, you know, he, Trump brought it up numerous times when he wasn't even asked. Yeah. Uh, so he was trying to get it into the yeah. bloodstream. But as far as a topic and how long they spent yeah. on abortion versus yes. the problems of immigration, yeah. you know, if you look at the minutes, it's different. I talk to business leaders around the country and they say, listen, if we can track a package in FedEx around the world and know exactly where it is, why can't we set up a system where we figure out who these people are and have a legal system. I don't think there's anybody who's against legal immigration. Yeah. It is this chaotic flow that has changed cities, not only along the border, but around yeah. the country. And that's the problem. Yeah. And you hear stories today regarding crime and innocent people, American citizens, that we don't really know. We know some of it's true, but we don't know the, the real accounting of how serious a problem it may or may not be but which gets me back to my bad pucks you know, you know i gotta make sure that you know, what we're putting up we're putting on the air is is real 50 years from now 
2074, you're dead. Mm-hmm. There's a, a new Wait addition. Wait a second, that'd be 104. It's possible. All right. So let's say 75 <laughs> years from now. There's a new edition of the World Encyclopedia just published. And under leaders, um, notables, mm-hmm. there's the name Red Bear. Mm-hmm. What do you want it to say? That's a great question. He was fair, trusted, and somebody uh, who covered things of consequence that made a difference in the world. I look at this moment and I think, I pinch myself because I'm sitting at a really critical part of history that's happening and unfolding before our eyes and there's a lot of responsibility behind being in that spot. I think years from now that I was fair, I did my job and I excelled, I was a family man and I had great balance in my life. Um, I think there are a lot of good people in the world and we need to focus on pulling out the good Um, I talked about that common ground thing I do. I do think there's more of that than we think. And the more that we can lift that up, the better. And if my epitaph is something about that, that would be good. Brett, I thoroughly enjoyed this discussion. I learned a lot. Um, I thought you were very fair. Uh, and unbiased, and I hope our, our readers enjoy reading as much as I did enjoy asking you these questions. Thank, Thank you very much. A lot of fun, Martin. A lot of fun. No publication covers the good life as completely as Cigar Aficionado. Each issue includes stories you won't find anywhere else, from the world's finest golf destinations to gourmet dining high-end drinks, and luxury product reviews. Plus, exclusive access and insight to the island nation of Cuba. You'll also find interviews with some of the world's most famous and intriguing personalities. And, of course, Cigar Aficionado's unparalleled coverage of fine cigars. Subscribe today to the ultimate men's lifestyle magazine at CigarAficionado.com.